Are you sitting in a space where you are struggling with anxiety? Do you feel like a prisoner to the cycles of depression? Do you feel stuck in your own life and feel frustrated and lost, but yet you know there is so much more on the other side of this mental breakdown? I want to hold your hand through this therapeutic life healing journey. I will help you navigate emotional healing, spiritual growth, and taking massive action so you can align your mind, body, and spirit to completely transforming your life. You are worthy of the life of your dreams, of stepping into your power and experiencing your breakdown as your breakthrough. Hey, I'm Adi. I'm your therapist, your coach, your mentor. Join me as we heal your life together. Welcome to the podcast. I just want to take a moment to thank you if you are a returning listener. Thank you for being here each week and tuning in to new episodes that I hope is fueling your healing journey. And if you're new to finding this podcast show, I welcome you. I hope that you stay and browse around, check out some of the other episodes and see what could be helpful on your healing journey. I trust that this podcast show is something valuable to you in your life at this time. And I'm excited for today's topic. We're going to dive deep into grief. And I have invited one of my dear friends who is also in the mental health field, and she specifically helps people with grief. Lisa is also the host of a top-ranked podcast called Grief is a Sneaky Bitch. And I can't wait for you to meet her today. Before we dive in, if you find this podcast show helpful to you in any way, or you just want me to know how it's been helping you, please leave a review. I would love to hear from you on what you think. And I read them personally, and it brings me just so much joy to hear from you from all over the world, folks who are tuning in. Now, let's get ready to dive into the episode. Welcome back to Therapeutic Life Healing with Adit. I'm so excited to have a dear friend of mine who is amazing at what she does. Her name is Lisa Keith Offer, and she is the founder of Grief is a Sneaky Bitch podcast, and she is the founder of Reimagining Grief. Lisa is a social worker. She is an advocate uh, in mental health and also does tons of grief work, which is how her and I came to meet and connect and all things like grief vibing, supporting one another through our journeys. So welcome to the podcast, Lisa. It's so great to have you here. Adit, it is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, you, listeners, you all should know the minute we spoke to each other the very first time, we just kind of fell in love with each other as friends and nerded out over all things mental health and grief. So this is so cool to be on your show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. I love these full circle moments where we met almost like a year and a half ago, connected to grief. And at some point I was like, Lisa, we got to have a co- like conversation about grief on my podcast. And then here yeah. we are. Here we so are. to have you. Lisa, will you introduce yourself and uh, your work, your, uh, you know, a little bit about your journey of how you became the founder of Reimagining Grief and anything else that you would want listeners to know about you before we dive into the topic of grief a bit more? Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. So as you mentioned, I'm the founder of Reimagining Grief. I started this work about two years ago, but I really think I've been on this journey to do grief and empathy work for a long time. Um, I worked in research, but spent most of my career as a social worker. So I trained as a narrative therapist and social worker, I think 20 years ago, I'm going to date myself here, Um, and spent a long time in lots of different nonprofit settings, foster care, adoption, public housing, crisis intervention, family services. And during that time, doing clinical work and program management, in the midst of all of that, um, my very previously healthy husband, Eric, um, went undiagnosed for about a year and then was diagnosed with a massive brain tumor and died within two weeks, leaving me a widow and a single parent to our daughter who was seven at the time. And I went back to work as clinical director and continued to do that work. And one of the things that I saw over the years was all the ways in which people who were presenting with other issues in therapeutic settings um, were actually having unacknowledged and unexpressed grief sort of at the root of a lot of what people were facing. And after another loss with a close friend, 
um, and some other experiences in my professional career, I realized I couldn't have had all that professional experience with grief and loss and then all of that personal experience with grief and loss. And as a writer and a public speaker, um, I sort of jumped off the cliff as it were and dove into creating Reimagining Grief, where I provide individual services, education, corporate training around grief and empathy, a line of uh, gift card, uh, empathy cards, excuse me, to help people show up um, for the people when they need them most and the podcast, as you mentioned. Um, so this work is deeply a deep passion of mine. As you know, every time we talk, I sort of nerd out and I just love helping to make more visible this thing a hundred percent of us go through. So that's kind of the story of how I got here and why I am that person who introduces themselves at the party and say, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, I talk about grief and death all the time. And I have a smile on my face, but I'm fun at a party. I promise. Oh, heck yeah. No, you are. We got to actually meet in real life after getting to meet each other on Instagram and we spent hours together. So I know you're, you're a <laughs> lot of fun, fun at a party. Yeah. yeah. We can talk about death, but also we can have a lot of joy in the same conversation. Well, we might go there today, but I really do think the people who've done the work of healing of whether it's around death loss or other kinds of grief, which we can talk about too, have the capacity to savor and enjoy life in some ways more than people who haven't faced those things. So yes, indeed, we are fun at a party. <laughs> Lisa, speaking of, I love that you said that because when we met and we started to talk about your process of how you've worked through grief and you know how you're able to also experience joy after having so much painful uh, experiences with loss. I mean, losing your husband and being a widow and a single parent, I mean, in such a short, quick amount of time was not easy yeah. at all. And so if you can share with listeners how you've been able to work through your process of grief and any ways that you could encourage others that, you know, your grief process is okay, however it needs to look and ways that you've done that for yourself and where it's brought you and led you to. And, and one of the things we had talked about was if you can, as you share your process yeah. is, is your, uh, AFCO philosophy. Mm. Oh, the old AFCO philosophy. I'm definitely going to break that down for your listeners, but maybe I could just start with sort of expanding our, the way we even think about grief. Cause of course I just shared some stories of death losses that I face, but one of the things I really try to do, and I want folks to really come to understand is that we can experience grief over lots of things, including non-death. So chronic illness, degenerative, you know, diseases and injury, divorce, relationships, loss of contact for other reasons, um, loss of future and dreams. So I think that's just really, I just say that because I want everybody to understand the ways in which we might grieve and we don't give ourselves permission to grieve. So I think the first place to start is understanding grief in its broader context and also understanding that unfortunately in the U.S., we live in a pretty grief avoidant, grief illiterate culture. And so one of the things I faced, even as a social worker, so here I was the clinical director of a big family services nonprofit, and when my husband died quite unexpectedly, and I was there with him when he died, I sort of looked around to my community. And though there were a few um, nonprofits or kind of support groups in the area, I recognized that even in my fellow social workers, my bosses, my colleagues, they didn't have the language to show up and support me. They didn't know how to talk. They didn't know how to what to expect as far as the timeline. They called me back to work in less than two weeks as the clinical director. And I returned because I was a single mother and that was my only income and for lots of other reasons. So the first thing I would say is whether or not you are a mental health professional, you've been through grief before or not, the first place to start is to understand you, everyone needs help. A hundred percent of us grieve and a hundred percent of us need help. Maybe not everybody needs to go to a therapist per se, or a grief guide like the services that I offer, but I, that was the first road I or barrier I had to overcome was like that I should know how to do it myself because, you know, I'm a social worker and I'm a clinical director. Um, so get, seeking help. I did go to support groups and early on, I took my daughter to support groups. I sought my own therapist at the time and the work over this path, it's, it'll be 10 years next month, 10 years in August. 
um, since my husband died. But one of the things that I've done consistently over that time is sought sort of, you know, talk therapy or supportive help. But I've also really spent a lot of time over these intervening years tuning inward to my body, doing a lot of mindfulness work, a lot of meditation work, listening into my body. Grief is an embodied response to loss. So we think about the stress response when we sort of flight, fight or flight. Our body basically lives in a stress response. So it took me a while to understand all of the symptomatology, the grief brain, the fog, you know, the fatigue, the forgetfulness, you know, the aches and pains, the sleep, the lack of sleep sometimes, and then too much sleep other times. I was judging myself and criticizing myself and, you know, kind of buying into our culture, like move on, get over it, get back to old Lisa. And people would say to me stupid things like that too. And I would say them to myself. I call those the shoulds of grief. I would should all over myself. So over the years, I've really had to basically unpack all those beliefs, grief beliefs that I had, and then find the tools that I need. Again, for me, movement, mindfulness, meditation, talk therapy, um, and just giving myself permission over and over and over again to, to feel whatever you're feeling. Because the other myth, there's so many, but another one I think is important to touch on is that grief is just that you only grieve things that you love and that it was people. And of course, we just said you can grieve lots of things that aren't people, but we can also grieve um, in ways that don't look the emotional part of grief. There's financial and physical and cognitive and existential, et cetera. But even in the emotional wheelhouse, I think you would agree, Adit, that we think of like sadness and sorrow and that's it. But grief has a whole rainbow of emotions. So another thing that I invite listeners to think about and that I had to really come to grips with were the ways in which all these other emotions were completely valid expressions of my grief. And so to not limit my own, you know, again, not to shit on myself, I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't be irritated. I shouldn't feel relief. I shouldn't feel happy. I shouldn't feel joy, all those things. One of the pivotal tools that actually helped me all along the way, and that's what you were referring to, is this acronym called AFCO, which I've had in my life actually since I was a teenager. So it predates uh, my husband's death and it stands for another fucking growth opportunity. It's currently tattooed on my body. And it came to me via my mother. How hip was she back in the day? Not particularly a swearer, but um, I went through an extremely violent traumatic event when I was a teenager and doing some therapeutic work and trying to do some healing work. And after that time, and when others kind of smaller incidents happen, I would be in kind of a struggling place and, but kind of do this therapeutic work, kind of do my own healing and kind of come out the other side. And my mom said, this is really one way to approach the little, the little T traumas or the little incidences and the big ones is to, when something happens to you, this isn't Everything happens for a reason. So please don't get me wrong. Cause if, if you're like me and someone says that to your face, I just want to pop them a good one, right? you real quick. So this isn't that approach. AFCO really invites us all to think about this thing happened to me. I'm telling a story about this event that happened to me. I can't change that. The only thing we have capacity to change is how we, for lack of a better word, use that experience to teach us something. So often things that happen to us that feel like injustices or hardships help. If we look inward, if we do the work, we can see them as growth opportunities. How can this help me um, maybe shift where I spend my time, the kind of relationships I invest in, the kind of work that I even do? I mean, that's an experience that I had for sure. Um, And just being able to, sometimes you don't want to hear it and we're not always ready to hear it. You know, do not say AFCO to somebody who just experienced some loss, right? This is not the time we're still in shock and we're numb, but knowing that I can sort of pull AFCO um, off the shelf for myself after I've kind of gone through something. And again, it can be even the little disappointments in life and say, hmm, this is another fucking growth opportunity. And even just saying those words, because I believe strongly in the power of narrative, even just saying those words helps me get out of a loop that I'm in. We can, all of us can get in. I'm raising my hand. If this was on video, guilty as charged, like why me? This always happens to me. Nothing ever good happens. And when I can say AFCO to myself, it's just like a little nudge to say like, 
hmm, I wonder where the growth is in this thing and how can I contribute to my own growth? Ah, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing. It's so inspiring to hear you go through your process. And I hope, you know, listeners, I trust our as they're listening, will take away some nuggets and gems and tweak it to their own life circumstance. And it makes me um, want to be curious with you and going a little bit deeper about like how to support someone who is grieving and whether it's you just got diagnosed with a terminal illness, you uh, lost mobility in some way, there is an actual death in a family member or friend, you know, how is someone, I, I, I get this question a lot. People struggle with how do I show up? What is yeah. the, what is the right thing to say? What is the right thing to do? And so from where you're sitting, having experienced it and also now doing it as your profession, what are some ways that people can show up for others who are in their grief and ways that it was helpful to you as well? I'm so glad you asked that question because actually I sort of think about my work having two main audiences. One, of course, is the fellow grievers out there and through the work that I do through my show. But the other audience is grief supporters, which is also all of us, by the way. Most of us are grievers and grief supporters sometimes at the exact same time. So if you take nothing else away from how do you offer good grief support, think about this. Show up, shut up, listen. That's my mantra. That's my grief support mantra. If you take away nothing else now to peel that back, cause you're probably saying, yeah, but Lisa, like, but what do I do? You know, um, I want to, I want to peel back one more layer first, which is before you show up to support somebody. And I mean that in a virtual show up, you know, text or email or voice memo or, you know, zoom or physically show up or send something. Remember this. Grief is not a problem that needs fixing, and it's not your job to fix that person. And I say that really plainly because we have a really fix it culture. We have a very pathologizing culture. You know, if any, if you're experiencing anything other than happiness, something's wrong and we got to fix it. And the truth is, the more you try to go in and fix a griever, quote unquote, the more you're telling them there's something wrong with you. I can't relate to you. And the less and less likely that griever is going to be to reach out to you for support in the future. So while your intentions may be good, I sort of want to invite everybody to pause before you show up, shut up and listen. And remember, it's not my job to fix them. It's not not my job to pity them, right? That's the sympathy part. I created a line of cards I call empathy cards, not sympathy cards, because I really wanted to give people tools to show up with empathy, which is not pity. Empathy is connecting to this shared kind of humanity. So all of that to say, that's, I really think that's the most, that's the most important thing you can do because then any action you take comes from a different place and the energy received by that griever is going to be completely different. So there's sort of a couple of categories I think of. There's like the practical categories So think about when someone's faced with a loss, whether it's they learn their own diagnosis and it's anticipatory grief, or they've, you know, the death loss of somebody or a pet. Remember that our brains kind of go into this state of shock. We have grief brain. So a lot of times the people who are maybe very capable, independent people, such as I was, don't have the capacity to sort of process all their everyday activities, whether it's food, remembering to pay bills, taking out the garbage, taking kids to their usual activities, et cetera. So depending on your relationship with a person, think about what are some practical things. We often think about food in this country, right? It's like the meal train, you know, to bring to people. And food is helpful though. One too many, you know, frozen things in my freezer there in the early days. So there's practical help and it can be everything from helping them set up auto pay to bills, taking in their garbage and not asking them what they need. Don't burden the griever. Just say, you know, I know your Jimmy goes to school with my Susie. How about for the next month? I'll just pick Jimmy up and drive him every day. That's one less thing you have to do, you know, just offer something. Then they can say no, but asking a griever what they need is almost just too much pressure. Sometimes people know, but often they don't. And then there's the less tangible, 
possibly more important, which is the emotional checking in support. So I'm thinking of you. I know this must be hard. However, you started something with something really important to eat at the beginning, which is whatever you're feeling is okay. And just that can be via a text. If you have a texting relationship, that can be via an email, that can be a voice memo. If you use apps like Marco Polo, so they can see your face, do it again with an agenda. One of my favorite things to do, and I've gotten so much feedback is to say in those messages, you don't have to respond to me because then there's so much pressure on the griever to feel like they have to write the thank you notes and they have to write everybody back. And I felt a lot of that pressure. And so now whenever I check in with the people in my life who are grieving or on the anniversary of their loss, I say, you don't need to respond to me. I just wanted you to know I'm thinking of you. I'm holding you in my heart. I'd love to, if you are up for it, I'd love, ask them to share a memory of their person. If it's a death loss, we have this belief that if we bring up the person's name, somehow it's going to upset the griever, except y'all, the griever is already thinking about that person. And when you don't ask, then they feel like I'm the only one carrying their memory forward. Again, it depends on your relationship with the person, but generally speaking, if it's not in the early days and weeks, if it's any time after that, Hey, I'm thinking of you. And I'm wondering if you wanted to share a memory of Joe with me, or I was just somewhere and I thought of Joe when this thing happened. So kind of share and, but all of that with that intention that you're not fixing, that you're coming alongside somebody, that you're holding space, you're bearing witness. And the last piece on this grief support that I'll say is keep showing up. So it's show up, shut up and listen. And then there's like dot, 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 keep showing up. The myth is that somehow after one month, two months, three months, I don't know what the magical number is that we're not grieving anymore. And that might be because you see us back to work or on social media, but the grief is something we will carry with us. We have a relationship with grief for the rest of our lives. So if you want to show up for somebody, make sure you keep showing up. It could be, you know, every three months, send a card or on the, at least on the anniversary, if not another time. So show up, shut up, listen, and keep showing up. I think my neck was going to fall off because I was nodding so hard to everything you were saying as a fellow griever that resonated 1 million thousand bajillion percent. And I imagine anyone who is on the other end listening, who is a fellow griever is also like nodding their head. And I invite you, you know, to share this episode with someone that you love who maybe you're struggling to share how they can support you. And just like hearing you, Lisa, was so validating and almost can like put words to my experience of how I want people to show up for me. I hate when I get advice. I'm like, just shut up. Just listen. Ask me questions about my person. And that's it. Like, just listen. I I really am not looking for your opinion, your advice. Do not tell me you understand because you didn't have that relationship. Don't be a grief thief. Don't say, oh, well, you know, (laughs) it's just like so-and-so in my blah, 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 blah. Like that's almost never the right answer. Don't do that. Don't be a grief thief. Don't do that. Uh, I've never heard grief thief, but I I love it. You always have these great like terminologies. I always take away after talking to you, but this was so helpful to hear just me sitting here. And so, yeah, invite others to share this episode. And as we begin to come to a close, Lisa, I I get this also a lot um, around grief and loss. Like how long is this going to take? How long for the griever, you know, sometimes when they're in it, especially in the very early stages, it feels like forever and like almost is, is like this dark tunnel that you don't see a light. So from your experience and in your work with other grievers, how would you respond to someone saying, how much longer am I going to be in this pain? Yeah. And, oh, just even you asking that question really brought me back to those early days of my own grief. And I remember wondering and thinking those same questions. The truth is it's going to be different for everyone. But the other truth is your relationship with grief will continue to change over time. So however you're feeling right now is not how you're going to be feeling in a month or three months or six months or six years. I'm not promising that it's going to be in some linear upward you know, stage model progression. I don't believe in that. I do think we always have a relationship with grief for the rest of our life. If we've had a really meaningful connection to something or someone. 
So I'm not a believer in that we get over grief. But what I do like to invite people think to think about is that we will have a relationship with grief that will change over time. Our The cognitive and physiological functioning of our body will return to kind of some homeostasis over for some people, it's three, six, nine months, you know, getting through that first year of anniversary. But one way to one way to remember um, when, especially when you're kind of in the earlier days and feeling like, is it always going to feel like this is no feeling ever in the history of your, however many years you've been on this planet has ever lasted forever. Think of the last time you were in deep heaving, screaming, crying. At some point you stopped. Last time you were angry, last time you were joyful, by the way, the good quote unquote feelings don't last either. So instead of kind of fixating on a certain date or a milestone or a time, take a time, take, use your mindfulness, use your breath work and remind yourself in your heart that you're always growing and healing and changing and that our emotions and our relationship with our emotions will change over time and to just give yourself some grace um, and trust in that. I, that is why I think shows like yours, I believe in the podcast of me being in community with other grievers helps us get some perspective because we can be a bit myopic in those early days when the pain is so intense. And I totally get that, but it will change over time. It probably already has changed for you as a listener. Um, it's just sometimes when we're in the deep wave of pain, it's hard to see kind of beyond the horizon of what we're looking at right now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. I feel like when we can talk to other grievers and have that shared experience, there's a way that that weight of pain kind of gets lifted. Even for just that moment, you feel not alone and some sense of hope that this will change, that this feeling will at some point be a little lesser intense. And so thank you. I feel like we've learned so much in this short time with you from like AFCO to <laughs> shut up, listen and show up. And, you know, you have all these great takeaways that just resonate a lot for not only someone who's grieving, but people who want to support the griever. So as we come to an end, Lisa, I'm sure listeners are like, okay, where and how do I get a in touch with her? Where do people find you if they want to work with you? What are some best ways for someone to connect with you? Well, first, let me just say it's such a pleasure to be on the show. I loved having this conversation. Of course, I love every moment that I spend with you. And I, I do hope that uh, what I shared today was helpful for your listeners. So you can follow me on social media. I post most actively on Instagram. I write these kind of daily invitations, these little tidbits um, quite frequently. So you can follow me at Reimagining Grief on Instagram. You can learn all about my products and services at reimagininggrief.com. And if you want to listen to more conversations about grief and loss, you can subscribe to my podcast, Grief is a Sneaky Bitch, which is available on all your favorite podcast platforms. And it's a top rated grief podcast. So I want to just shout you out because it's very inspiring to see someone who's gone through so much pain and transform that pain into something that feels fulfilling, meaningful, and helping others all at the same time. And so I hope that this, and I trust that this episode will maybe inspire others who are in their grief journey, that there's ways to, at some point, maybe transform that pain into something meaningful to you. And you've been someone who's done that. And I look up to you. I admire you. I love you. Um, oh, I love you and, too. Thank you. <laughs> and as we end, I always ask this last question of all my guests is what's one thing intuitively that you can tap into right now that you want to leave listeners with before we end? Um, I think my, my inner knowing, I think using my gaze, using that compassionate gaze, I invited all of us to offer to others is I know for sure that if I turn that compassionate gaze inward, I will find exactly what I need. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being here. And we definitely have to bring you on next time again. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great time. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I trust that you took away some gems, some 
highlights for yourself in this episode. And I want to invite you to dive deeper with me if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one personalized healing session where we can really dive deeper into what's coming up for you, what you're struggling with, if you're in a place of transition in your life, whether that's relationships, careers, if you're struggling with boundaries, and we can really unpack that together and create a breakthrough session for you. Go ahead and email me at hello at aditc.com. That's hello at aditc.com. It's also in the show notes. I also offer a virtual master course That's a therapeutic life healing master course that's virtual, self-paced at home. And it's guided with slides and videos of me really walking you through a three-week structured program that will help you learn about boundaries, understand fear in the brain and how it has shown up in your life. There's journal prompts and guided meditations. So go to aditsi.com and click on virtual master course to see the curriculum today and you can enroll wherever you are in the world right away and start in the comfort of your own home today if you found any value in today's episode please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast and leave a review i'd love to hear from you and what you think and i hope that you take care of yourself on your healing journey and take care of each other